Hello, everybody. Welcome to, today, to today's Revive webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. My name is Astrid Pence moore and I'm hosting this webinar on the development of and use of in vivo models for infectious disease research. For those of you who are joining our webinars for the first time, REVIVE is GARDP's education and outreach program, and it aims to support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. All webinars are recorded in full and can be viewed after the live broadcast on our website, revive.gardp.org slash webinars. I encourage you all to visit the REVIVE website to stay up to date about future webinars, watch recordings of previous webinars, and also to find other information. For example, we also host a blog about AMR-related topics. As usual, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions window in your webinar control panel as shown on the slide. We will address the questions after our presentation, and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible. Today's speaker is William Weiss, and our moderator is Peter Warren, Senior Vice President for Anti-Infective Discovery at Evotech. Welcome, Peter and William. Peter, I'm now handing over to you. Thank you, Astrid. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. William Weiss, um, who's going to be taking this presentation. Um, William is the uh, Director of Preclinical Services at the University of Texas uh, Systems College of Pharmacy, North Texas, Fort Worth. He, he's been there for a long time, um, 38 year, he's got 38 years of experience and an enormous amount of expertise in infectious disease research. Um, and he's worked with um, a, a vast array of antibacterial agents during that time. He's um, established multiple models of both acute disease and, and chronic bacterial infections in, in a range of different animal species, uh, um, as well as running the supporting pharmacokinetic studies that are required, and, um, and is also very familiar with the um, bioanalytical processes, um, HVLC, LCMS, uh, and he's worked with um, uh, both large pharmaceutical companies, biotechs, um, as well as academia. Prior to working in, in Texas uh, or in the University of Texas, he was Director of Drug Evaluations at Cumbre Pharmaceuticals, um, where he looked after um, animal models of efficacy and pharmacology and all the preclinical microbiology research and development efforts, which were focused on the discovery and development of uh, novel antimicrobial agents. Prior to this, he was a group leader in infectious diseases uh, um, at uh, Wyeth, uh, Lederal Laboratories and Shearing Plough. And he's held various positions um, working uh, in various responsibilities, working with antibacterials, antivirals and antifungal um, research. Um, he's worked on a wide range of antibacterial programs, um, including the development of, um, of, of Suprax, uh, Zostin and, and Tigacil. Uh, and with that, I'd like to um, welcome William to the presentation and very much look forward to, uh, to listening to what's, uh, what's going to be presented. Uh, thank you, Peter. And, and I want to thank the Gord P. Revive organizers for asking me to give this talk. As Peter alluded to, we're going to be discussing uh, animal models of infection. And I'd like to try to run this as a type of workshop where we will look into the uh, development of models and examples of those models. And if I can change the slide, I would, there we go. Um, so we're gonna go through the experimental design of these models, what you need to look for, how you need to set up those models and what's important in those models, where to start, what model to use. And then I'd like to finish up with giving some examples of um, are these models indicative of um, the clinical condition and, and do they predict clinical efficacy? And if you can look at animal models, you really have to go through the background of those models and look back around 150 years to the likes of Charles Darwin and Louis Pasteur of how they looked into the treatment of animals and the importance of these vaccines or 
um, treatments in curing those infections. And, and really, back in 1890, Koch's postulates really define both the causative agents of disease and how we set up these animal models. So if you look at these postulates, the organism has to be found in specific cases of disease and has to be isolated from the organism, in this case, the person or the animal, suffering from that disease. And that really defines an animal model. We have to be able to induce the disease in an animal and be able to show that that organism is the cause of the symptoms that we observe in that model. But it was really uh, Gerhard Dombach, who actually won a Nobel Prize for his work. Um, back in 1935, he was working for IG Farben at the time, which is a conglomerate of uh, pharmaceutical entities like Bayer and Hoekst, uh, where he started testing new agents, and Prontosil is a sulfonamide, where he tested these agents in mice and rabbits to show protection from strep and staph infections. And the conclusions there were, we can show um, curing of these bacterial infections in these animal models by the drugs, and that this is going to be an indispensable part of the type of pharmaceutical testing using in vivo models. Um, so testing, if you look at this article, testing has become a, a very recognized and essential part. And when you're looking at preclinical anti-infective the process, whether that be in a small company or in a large farm, it really starts with formation of an exploratory team where you, you identify a target or you identify a lead series or modifications of known series. Uh, medicinal chemistry efforts kick in to synthesize more and more molecules. You'll confirm your target activity in vitro. Uh, you, does the, each of these new agents hit the target you're intending to go for? You'll have a series of in vitro evaluations. So these typically in antibacterials. These are your MICs, time kill curves, uh, inhibition assays to know that the new agent is hitting that target, but then what? Where do you go from there? And that's where your proof of concept studies kick in in your animal models. And in performing an animal model, if you design it properly, if you conduct it properly, you're going to be able to, number one, use clinically relevant pathogens. Lab strains are fine, but if you're looking to treat infections these days with the multi-drug resistant strains that we're seeing, you really need to use clinically relevant pathogens. You need to investigate the interaction of that pathogen with the host, where it interacts. Obviously, if you're looking at infections like pneumonia, you want to look at interactions at the epithelial lining. If you're looking for UTI, you want that microbe to go to that site of infection, kidney, bladder, and so on. Um, a good model is going to be allow you to evaluate the efficacy of, of either both therapeutic and prophylactic treatments, small molecules therapeutically, uh, vaccines or, or antibodies prophylactically. You'll be able to analyze the PK. You know, if you see efficacy or you don't see efficacy, what does it do to? Uh, and you'll be able to test for a drug tolerability and efficacy. Um, so where do you go? When do you move from in vitro screening to an in vivo model? And, and that question has changed over the years, back from when I started in the 80s, to what it is today. So. Where do you go from in vitro assays? Well, you have a number, a lot of data from a number of in vitro assays. You have an MIC panel. You have information about the stability of the compound and you want to move forward, but when do you do that? When, where, how do you translate that in vitro data to in vivo efficacy? And we get a lot of questions when we're running our models here. What is the criteria for moving forward? Does my MIC have to be in the nanogram per mil range? And we've gone from in vitro to in vivo for anything from two nanogram per mil MIC, minimum inhibitory concentration in an in vitro assay. We've even looked at 100 microgram per mil MICs, moving those molecules forward into the animal model. Decision has to be made of what warrants you to move forward. Um, you want to determine where the molecule goes in the body, where does it distribute to? that will give you some type of indication of what clinical condition are you looking for. Is it cleared through the kidneys that might be usable in a UTI infection? Is it absorbed uh, 
into the epithelial lining fluid of the lung, which would be useful in lung infections. Does it distribute to bone for osteomyelitis? The ADME properties, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and inhalation that you find out will be very useful uh, for looking at these types. Um, and the other thing is supportive in-life data is required for grant funding and submission. This has become a very real um, problem these days is that the support of drug discovery comes through things like CARBEX, grant submissions, RO1s. And for a lot of those submissions, supporting in vivo data is going to be very important um, for strengthening that submission. So a lot of times, these in vivo models will just be for proof of concept to show you have some type of in vivo data to move forward to. So what do you perform first? Well, you can look at efficacy, you look at PK, you can look at tolerability in the form of maximum tolerated dose or MTD. And we're gonna go through that a little bit later about the uh, advantages and disadvantages of one or the other. Um, and also what study you perform first is gonna be very reliant on how much material you have. Um, when we go to do a lot of these animal models and we're asked how much material you need for all this testing, we talk hundreds of milligrams of material, um, it's kind of a shock for some investigators who maybe have 20 milligrams to prove what they need to, to show. So if we can combine some of these experimental endpoints, for instance, doing an efficacy study and possibly PK at the same time, it could be more efficient. Um, the other question that comes up, how do we dose? What route do we dose? What regimen do we use? What's the best formulation? So in terms of dose, route, regimen, and formulation, we'll go through a lot of these in a little bit more detail, but how do you decide what dose to start at? A lot of that can come from the MIC. The MIC is very low, obviously the dose could be a little bit lower. If the MIC is a lot higher, then we might have to start at a higher dose. The route you go by, clinically relevant, is always good. If you're going to have a parenteral antibiotic, dosing IV is, is a great way if it's tolerated, if you can formulate it. If you're going for an oral drug and you know something about bioavailability, we could dose orally. Um, surrogate, IP sub Q routes are fine. Uh, we can get the compound in there. We can look at how it distributes. We can look at the effect on efficacy. The regimen, again, is dependent on the animal models. Is this a single dose study, like a 24 hour model? Is it a chronic study where we're doing multiple time points, multiple endpoints? We're dosing for three, four, seven, 14 days. It depends on the model, it depends on the compound. And again, the formulation is going to be dependent on tolerability and solubility. There's very little that a mouse, for instance, can tolerate in terms of organics. So more aqueous solubility is always good, but not always possible, in which case sometimes we have to move to a higher species. And I'm having trouble past everything. Thank you. So where do I start? Well, there's three different scenarios listed here, maximum tolerated dose, then PK, then efficacy, or you can look at PK first, or you can look at efficacy first. In the best of all possible worlds where there's plenty of time and money, which is something that doesn't exist in drug discovery these days, um, it's hard to do everything at once. But if you did maximum tolerated dose followed by PK, followed by efficacy would be the better way to go. It gives you the best exposure you could have uh, you can then use that exposure to run your PK, looking at a dose response at multiples of that maximum tolerated dose, see whether or not you have dose proportionality in exposure. Um, you can then look at uh, the dose ranging efficacy using that MTD as a starting point. However, if we are limited by money, if we're limited by time, if we're limited by um, compound availability, we may want to just look at PK first, determine where the compound distributes to, and then use that to determine the efficacy study you're going to do. If, however, as I alluded to earlier, you need proof of concept study, you just need efficacy and at risk, we can look at that. 
we can do an efficacy dose ranging study first and then go back and look at maximum tolerated dose and PK. So it's really dictated by a lot of different parameters in terms of what you need to see and what time you have to do it. There really isn't any one right way to do it. It is dependent on the individual situation of the group looking to do these types of studies. So when you select an animal model, it has to be relevant. It has to have some type of connection to the clinical condition. So it must represent a current clinical indication because that's what you're going to be doing your phase two trials in. So it needs to be an animal model representative of a lung infection like pneumonia, UTIs, uh, skin infections, wounds, birds, bacteremia, et cetera. Uh, it, it has to mimic at least that condition. We're going to show some examples of that uh, in ensuing slides. It has to make use of relevant bacterial strains. Uh, it has to be, in my mind, again, this is my opinion, it has to be clinical isolates that are found from that clinical indication. And what I mean by that is, if you're going to develop a UTI model, you really need to start with uropathogenic E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. Uh, if you're going to do a pneumonia model, then a clinical ISA that came from a lung aspirant, aspirate or bronchial lavage would be the best way to move forward. You have the best chance of developing that model with that type of isolate. You're not going to try to get a pneumonia model working with a UTI isolate. So that becomes very important in my mind to start with clinical isolates. You have to utilize current strains of concern, multi-drug resistant, your priority pathogens from the CDC or the World Health Organization. These are the infections that are the greatest concern. These are the infections we're looking to fight. Trying to use a lab strain, maybe for proof of concept, but not for evaluation of novel articles. ATCC strains are fine. Susceptible strains are fine if you're looking at the difference between susceptible uh, and resistant strains for the action of your compound. But in my mind, clinical indication isolates and multi-drug resistance are the best way to go. Uh, you have to involve proper, proper dose routes, and we kind of alluded to that a little earlier with if it's IV or if it's oral. But in the case of, say, bacteremia, which the animal model for bacteremia is an IP infection, intraperitoneal, you don't want to be dosing your agent by the same exact route, IP. I've seen a lot of posters and a lot of papers that do this, claiming efficacy, but all you're really doing is reducing your actual inoculum so you're getting a false positive in my mind for that efficacy. So you have to avoid inoculating your, uh, treating your infection and inoculating in the same way. Um, in the case of topical, that's a little bit different. And we'll go into an example of what that looks like. You need to define a measure of efficacy. What are you looking for? And basically in most of these animal models, it's bacterial titers at the site of infection, or it's survival, time to survival, decreased mortality. And it is model dependent, which we'll see some examples of. You also need controls. Positive control would be great to see. What is the current standard drug of choice? And what does that do in your animal model? Can you validate your animal model with that drug of choice? And a lot of times you can't do that because you're using multi-drug resistant pathogens nothing works clinically so nothing will necessarily work in your animal model so sometimes those positive controls actually become a negative control you also need your vehicle control especially if you have an odd formulation involving an organic or something other than just pure aqueous to make sure that the vehicle itself has no effect on the activity observed in terms of survival or bacterial titer reductions So it, it is impossible to give specific rules for the best choice for any one model. And there's things you have to consider. So when you're considering the animal system, what animal are you going to use? The species most used in infection disease research in animals, obviously is the mouse, but it also includes rat, hamster, guinea pig, rabbit, um, and very specific to what you're doing. Mouse can be done for a lot of these. 
RAT is done for uh, if you need a larger species, if you have problems with formulation. Uh, C. difficile is very relevant for the hamster. A lot of skin studies are done in rabbits. Uh, osteomyelitis and even endocarditis in the rabbit. So your choice of your animal system is dependent on the type of animal model you're looking uh, to develop or show efficacy in. The size matters. You going from a 20 gram mouse to a two and a half kilo rabbit. This comes back to how much test article do you have? Because a lot of times these models that we're running are in discovery mode and compound availability is always an issue. We're always asked how many animals in each group, what numbers do we need? Are three per dose group uh, fine? Do you need five? Do you need 10? And you can run a power analysis to determine when you want a stereostatistical significance, how many you need in each group. But from a practical nature, uh, if you have dozens of compounds you want to screen, you can screen with very few animals look at your hits and then confirm that activity with more. And in a general rule, in a survival study, we like to use five animals per group, five test article dose levels, and repeat that on two different occasions. Gives you an overall N of 10 and shows you day-to-day -day variation for that survival. If you're doing a bacterial titer endpoint where you have multiple dosing days, or even multiple infection times. A good rule is the more manipulations you have to animals and the more time it takes to run the, the model, the more animals you should have in those types of groups. So if we're running a model where bacterial titer is an endpoint, there's multiple dosing days, and we're maybe looking at several endpoints, we like to go upwards of 10 animals for that type of study. Uh, sex or the age of the animal comes into play, males or females. There's a lot going on with when you're doing grant submissions these days, the requirements are running both males and females to see if there's any sex differences in both PK or efficacy of your test article. Uh, for the most part, a lot of the development work has always been done in female animals. They're a lot easier to work with. There's certain cases where it's model specific. UTI in female mice is just a lot easier to run uh, and more prevalent, more relevant. Uh, some of your antifungal models, male mice, are actually better to use. It's more reproducible. You have to worry about the age. You can use neonates. You can use mature animals. When you're doing some advanced models that are maybe taking 80 days, this has to come into play. For instance, in a hamster model of C. difficile disease where you're testing vaccines, you might have 60 days worth of uh, vaccinating, immunizing the, the hamsters prior to the actual infection. That has to be taken into account when you start the study because the infection itself really relies on the exact age of the animal. So you have to factor those age and sex of the animals in when selecting a model or developing one. The strain of animal, in this case, we're going through a lot of mice here in the beginning. The standard workhorse, the albino mice, the ICR, or otherwise known as CD1, uh, is very good for most of your models. Um, on a practical note, again, it's the least expensive of these if you're doing a lot of studies. However, strains like the C3H, it's a brown mouse, uh, has always been very good for running UTI models. C57s have always reacted well. These are both inbred strains are better for doing things like prosthetic joint or osteomyelitis studies. Um, again, even the, your strain of rabbit, Duncan Hartley of New Zealand, whether you're running things like osteomyelitis or maybe eye infection studies, comes into play and you have to make the right choice of which species to use. One of the big questions that always comes up is, are these animals immunocompetent or immunocompromised? Uh, very important to choose the right one. Sometimes you have to have an infection immunocompromised because you cannot produce a reasonable infection that has reasonable endpoints in immunocompetent animals, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Source of the animals, there are commercial vendors or in-house breeding colonies if you have the room, and the source of those animals becomes important whether they're pathogen-free. 
Uh, we found in-house that even the same C57s from some of these vendors, the reaction and UTI model are different. Uh, so you have to develop that model with that in mind. And also the route of inoculation of these animals has to mimic a clinically relevant route. If you're doing a lung infection, uh, pneumonia type model, uh, intranasal intratracheal is the way the natural progression of the disease occurs. So you want to do it the same way. Uh, same thing for things like UTI being a transurethral inoculation. And we'll show example uh, a little bit later what that looks like. So the choice of the bacteria, we talked a little bit about that. Um, you could use the resistant or susceptible strains. Um, I'm recommending, since we're fighting a lot of drug resistance, we try to look at efficacy in drug resistance strains and get the virulence of those strains. Um, if you're looking at something like a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, it might be good to show equivalent activity in a susceptible strain and a strain producing the particular enzyme, be it ESBL, NDM, or KPC, that you're looking to treat. Um, in setting those strains up in an animal model, you have to do several virulence studies in order to show the proper inoculum. Um, you have to determine whether or not this animal has to be immunocompromised or not. So if you need to knock down the neutrophils for the course of the infection, typically we're using cyclophosphamide at a set dose to reduce the neutrophils so the infection can take hold. This is particularly true of things like if you're doing the thigh infection for PKPD, if you're doing lung infections with acinetobacter or MRSA, um, you need to immunocompromise most of these animals. There are some cases like Klebsiella's and other Pseudomonas that can do the same thing in normal animals. Uh, you have to optimize the inoculum. You want to create an infection that is consistent, that is valid over the time course, be it a 24-hour bacteremia or say a three or four day UTI uh, that creates the infection and the infection stays for that length of time without killing the animal too soon. So that's an interplay of the uh, concentration of your inoculum of the bacteria in your inoculum and the volume you can instill. You can IP infect for bacteremia for, with up to half a mil. However, if you're doing intranasals in a mouse or transurethrals in a mouse, you're limited to something on the order of 40 to 50 microliters. So you're balancing between your concentration bacteria and the volume that you can instill. You want to be able to choose the right species. The uh, mouse is very resistant to C. difficile infection, but it's possible. Hamster is much easier to induce the disease in. As you're developing this model, you want to validate that uh, with a known drug, if possible, to show that you have a valid model, that it can be treated at all. Uh, and if you're doing a bacterial titer endpoint, looking at CFU uh, collections, you need a media that you can recover the pathogen on. And that even goes back to Koch's postulates. Can you recover the bacteria from the infection? There's a lot of infections where there may be commensal bacteria present, and you want to identify pathogen you started with. So you're looking for a media to isolate your particular pathogen. So you can use something like mannitol salt agar for recovery of Staph aureus. It won't recover anything else. Certain citrate agars for recovering pseudomonas. And these become very important when you're looking at uh, mixed infection models, which we have an example of later. Uh, the choice of dosing scheme, uh, again, are you going IV, are you going sub-Q, oral, intraperitoneal, intramuscular, intranasal, are you doing an aerosol? Depends on the species, whether you can dose that IV because of your formulation, depends on the solubility. What regimen are you going to use? Is this a single dose study? Is it BID or TID, twice a day, three times a day? Uh, are those equally spaced? Or are you dosing something Q6 hour, every six hours, every two hours? Are you going to do a loading dose? Are you going to do an, an infusion pump? Are you going to use these osmotic pumps that are implantable? You need to figure out what that dosing scheme is and how do you figure that out? A lot of that has to do with if you have PK data, uh, 
Uh, a lot of it has to do with the model. Is it a 24-hour model, a three-day model? Has to be determined prior to it. Do we know anything about the half-life of the compound? If it's something like a carbapenem, where in mice you have a 15-minute half-life, we need more frequent dosing um, if you have the material available. What's the dosing period? Is it a single day where you may be doing BIDs like bacteremia? Is it a 14-day study for something like a biofilm infection? The dosing period, the dosing regimen, and the total doses given really rely a lot on the model and what you know about the agent to start with. Are you dosing prophylactically with an antibody, with an immunomodulator, with a vaccine? How far in advance do you have to do that? Uh, is it something that induces an immune response? How long does that response last? When do you start the dosing? If it's a therapeutic, like a lot of the studies are, with small molecules, you're going to do a therapeutic regimen at a specific time after the infection, and we'll talk about that later. Choice of formulation is important. You want to have a soluble compound. Um, it's tough to do. Solubility, when we look at certain molecules that haven't had it done, is relative. Chemists will say, yes, it's soluble, because DMSO is an agent you can solubilize in. Really hard for a biologist to dose that into an animal. Most mice will only tolerate a small amount of organic. Uh, we're talking less than 2% maybe of DMSO, DMA, ethanol, in order to get this in solution. So formulation becomes a big issue in doing a lot of these animal studies, and it's a lot to work through. But there are a lot of formulations that can be used like hydroxypropyl beta cyclodextrin, certain amounts of ethanol, um, and other types of even sugars to help get these into solution. Choice of endpoint, we have to decide what we're going to measure. Is it survival? And a survival endpoint can range from anywhere from 24 hours for a bacteremia model to as long as three weeks for something like a hamster model of C. difficile disease. Survival can be measured for lung infections, bacteremia, sequel ligation, and C. diff. Readouts there would be a median effective doses, or you can look at survival curves. Your efficacy readout can be total survival versus infection controls. It could be time to mortality as a measure of efficacy. If you're looking at CFU titers, again, this can range anywhere from a 24 hour to as, as much as four weeks for certain biofilm infections or prosthetic joint infections. And here again, your readout is mean CFU levels for your group. And you can look at both one-way ANOVA or non-parametric statistics to look at efficacy versus control or other dose groups to see whether or not you have statistical significance with your efficacy. Surrogate markers like biomarkers, you could look at cytokine response. Uh, you could look at bacterial toxin production or um, reduction in bacterial toxin production. You look at these values and again, do the same type of statistics. So the readout is sometimes dependent on the model, uh, but if you're looking for some type of measure of efficacy, there are several available. So with all this in mind, which I went through rather quickly, and we can, we can discuss that in, in the question time frame, there are many factors that go into developing an animal model, validating the animal model, and testing new agents in that animal model. Well, from the strain point of view, bacterial strain, the test article, the animal you're using, vehicles, formulations, dose calculations, what endpoint, other OBS, and the analysis that you're going to do. It has to be developed right. It has to be validated. You have to design it so that you're going to answer the questions you need. Worst thing you can do is have a poorly designed study that once you look at the data, you have no idea what it means in terms of the efficacy of the material you've just tested. If you define all these parameters up front, you're going to get the best possible outcome and be able to explain the data you get out of that animal model. So one of the questions that is always around are, are these animal models reflective of the clinical condition that you're trying to treat? I want to go through a couple of examples. Uh, so for something like bacteremia or septicemia, bloodstream infections, uh, where you could have other responses in terms of sepsis up to septic shock. The bacteria itself is usually introduced into the host 
uh, maybe from medical procedure, surgery, a dental procedure, uh, some type of injection, puncture wound, or something like that where the bacteria can get into the bloodstream. Clinical evaluable endpoint for such a model is usually survival. Uh, whether or not the patient dies or not is obviously a very clear endpoint. Or monitoring blood cultures and looking at clearance of the bacteria from the blood culture. So if you look at an animal model for septicemia, you're injecting the bacteria. Again, going back to you've got the right inoculum, you've already tested this out, you know the strain you're using. You're injecting that bacteria either intraperitoneally or intravenous route to put it into the animal, to get it into the bloodstream. It will disseminate through the blood into different organ systems. And a lot of cases, if you designed it properly, cause mortality in untreated controls. So what are our endpoints for the animal model and how they relate to the clinical endpoint? Well, we can look at survival. If you look at the left-hand graph for survival, uh, you see that the untreated controls, you're seeing close to 90% mortality in 24 to 48 hours after the infection. Treatment in this case with Miro Penem does very little. Uh, it pretty much mimics the untreated control. This happened to be a KPC producing strain. However, treatment with Miro plus a beta lactamase inhibitor, we're calling compound one, enhances survival and we now have 80% survival. So you're looking at survival as an endpoint. You're going from 10% survival to 80%. You can calculate the 50s off of this. You can do Kepler-Meyer analysis to show the significance of the treatment in curing the animal, and survival is an endpoint clinically. However, you could also look at titers. Over the course of the study, you can take blood and spleen samples from separate mice. You could look at the bacterial titers, and you could look at the effective efficacy, and we see something that parallels the survival, where we see an increase in both blood and spleen after 24 hours. It stops there because all the animals at that point uh, had succumbed to the infection. However, uh, treatment with the combination where we had 80% survival does correlate to a reduction in the titers in both the spleen and the blood. So here we have the animal model that can mimic two different endpoints to a clinical condition of bacteremia or septicemia. So moving to lung infections, again, here, when you get pneumonia, get a lung infection, you're getting the organism entering through the distal airway, you're inhaling it uh, into your lungs. There can be also a hematogenous seeding, multiplies in the epithelium, triggers an immune response, inflammation, and so on, where you get it, uh, increased production of uh, the organism in that lining fluid. So how do you diagnose a lung infection? Well, there's bronchial lavage, there's also a sputum test where the organism can be recovered um, and analyzed and identified. You could also get mortality from certain lung infections like ventilator associated pneumonia with Klebs or pseudomonal strains. So in an animal model system, we will introduce the bacteria again the same way it's introduced clinically. Intranasal drops or aerosol intratracheal inoculation into the lungs, and we're measuring both titers and mortality uh, in the lungs of infected animals. Very quickly, we can look at a couple of different endpoints. Now, the Staph aureus, this was done in normal and neutropenic animals. The data here give us about three different bits of information. It shows us that in normal animals, we do see a dose response with our inoculums, higher inoculums, you have a more sustained infection over 24 hours, about seven logs of bacteria, lower inoculums, the animal is clearing the infection by itself. In neutropenic animals, we also see a dose response. However, the infection in neutropenic animals compared to normal at the same inoculum levels is more sustained. We're maintaining eight to nine logs of bacteria by 24 hours in neutropenic animals, showing that in this case, the immunocompromised state is needed for the MRSA infection to take hold. We could also look at survival, the correlation of survival and bacterial lung CFU. In this case, we're looking at a Klebsiella and a Pseudomonas lung infection. We see mortality in three to five days for the Kleb and the Pseudomonas, which correlates to lung titers of upwards of eight to nine logs. So the increased lung titers, 
we have higher titus for the club. We also have shorter time to mortality for the club. In the case of Acinetobacter on the bottom, it's less of a virulent infection in the lung, more of a chronic, if we can use that word. We can go out to 72 hours. We see a very sustained level of bacteria in the lung, so we can extend that time point out a little bit further. UTI infections, again, for this, we're usually, it's an ascending UTI, usually coming from the fecal reservoir through the urethra into the bladder and eventually into the kidneys. So it's a very, it's an ascending one. You could also have a hematogenous dissemination into the bloodstream um, and developing this pyonephritis. The experimental way of doing this, we do a transurethral inoculation. Again, going back to that natural route of inoculation of the bacteria, I've seen some posters or people that have done this UTI model claiming 100% infectivity. They've done an injection through the abdominal wall directly into the kidney, which again is not the natural progression of the disease. Transurethral inoculation will form an ascending model into the urinary tract. You could see on the CFU graph for where this was an E. coli for the mirror and UTI model with transurethral inoculation. We have a day four and a day seven counts in the kidney, the bladder, and the urine, and it's fairly stable in about a seven log range in each of those matrices over that time period. And we have a day four number there because that is how long we wait before we start treatment in the model because we were waiting for this model to develop to an actual condition. When you're presenting clinically with a UTI, you're presenting when you have uh, symptoms and you have pain. So we want this model to establish. Here again, I've seen this model done where they do a transurethral inoculation followed an hour later by start of treatment. And all you're doing there is preventing the infection from taking hold. And in my mind, getting slightly false efficacy measure. Since you could also get a UTI and seeding of the kidney from a hematogenous source, we can also run this model with an IV infection, uh, looking at the progression of kidney titers over time for both E. coli and Staph aureus. Sometimes in this particular model, we are causing some damage for the kidney for this to take hold, but it's not always needing, sorry, pathogen specific. Skin and skin structure infections is a lot of nomenclature that applies to the same thing. Um, these can be anywhere from cellulitis to burn infections to, to deep seated abscesses in the cutaneous space. Endpoint for such a model, endpoint clinically, are you going to be effective? Is you're going to reduce the lesion side, size, or are you going to come back with negative cultures from that site of infection? There are two different animal models that are available to show efficacy in this type of model. There's the superficial wound infection, um, and then there's a subcutaneous abscess. So here we're looking at these subcutaneous abscesses on the backs of mice. Uh, we're looking at two different organisms, and we're looking at the progression of a bacterial titer in those lesions over time. And you can see in both cases, both for strep pyogenes and staph aureus, over that time period from the four hour post inoculation to day four, we're increasing about two to three logs of bacterial titers in those wounds. You could also measure um, those abscesses, they will increase in size. Uh, and that could also be a measure of efficacy is the reduction in that lesion size. Strep pyogenes can get necrotic. You could look at the progression, prevention of that necrosis in the model. The superficial skin can also be used for wound healing. We're looking at an abrasion on the skin with the superficial wound. Here we can do mixed infections. In this particular model, it was a mixed infection with a gram positive and a gram negative. Staph and Pseudomonas, they're both infected, topically treated. You can look at the actual titers from, again, four hours through day four. Here's one where once you take your sample, you need to play it on that differential media that I spoke about earlier, being able to recover each individual bacteria from the infection. But again, we're going almost three logs in increase over that time period in the model. So we're going back to bacterial titers being an endpoint, 
at the site of infection and wound or lesion size to be related back to this clinical condition. <clears throat> and quickly, running out of time, I think, implant associated infections clinically, um, you know, this is something like a prosthetic joint infection. This is an effect in implanted hip, knee, pins, plates, anything you're implanting that is foreign to the host is prone to infection. Staph aureus is probably the prevalent pathogen in that. You got this surface attachment followed by biofilm formation and adhesion. There are several different animal models for this. Uh, the prosthetic and joint infection in the mouse is implantation of a titanium pin into the femur. Uh, you inoculate this space upon implantation with the staph aureus. You can measure both the titers on the pin itself, biofilm associated, as well as in the femur itself, osteomyelitis associated. And you can see in the model, you're going out to 14 days, it's a fairly chronic infection. You have titers of five to seven logs, depending on which you're measuring, be it the pin or the titer or, or the uh, femur. Subcutaneous implant, this is a, a Teflon catheter that's implanted subcutaneously. We went back and looked at scanning electron micrographs of that to prove we had a biofilm infection. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is stable over a very long period kind of 28 days with seven logs of bacteria present on that implant. So prosthetic joint or any type of implant associated infection is extremely serious, hard to treat infection, very chronic. A lot of times the clinical cure is removal of the device. So an animal model that can mimic the longevity of that infection becomes important. This also applies to fungal infections, invasive candidiasis. Uh, you can do the same type of thing. Deep-seated candidiasis will come from a, a dissemination from, say, a central venous catheter. Uh, it'll disseminate and spread a lot of times to kidney, brain. Uh, mortality can be high, as much as 40% in some patients. So you have a, an endpoint of mortality. You have an endpoint of titers. You can do an animal model of invasive candidiasis with things like albicans, cruciae, or oris. Uh, this can be done in immunocompetent or compromised, depending on particular strain you're working with. Uh, Albicans can a lot of times be done in immunocompetent, whereas some of the crusade or oris require immunocompromised. You can measure both survival and bacterial titers, as with the clinical condition. This is a C. albicans infection model. Uh, these are the untreated, you have an untreated control where you see 90% mortality by day six. You have kidney titers close to seven logs. Treatment with fluconazole, in this case, it was for five days once a day, uh, orally at 10 mg per kg. You see that you reduce that close to three logs, the titers, and then what goes along with it, now you have 90% survival. So you have one animal model for invasive candidiasis that you can use two different endpoints to show efficacy, and they will correlate. Another important part of animal models is correlating the efficacy. And then lastly, are in vivo animal models results predictive of clinical efficacy? I'll try to go through this quickly. Um, this is a UTI model that was done with uh, a Kagen's neoglycoside. At the time, it was ACHN490, twice a day for three days, starting four, hour, four days after infection. Like I said, we've set up that infection. You see, you got a reduction in kidney titers down to the level of detectability, about three logs that is about four to five logs lower than control. So this was done back in 2010 to show that this new compound at the time was efficacious in a UTI model with an E. coli. Kagen's uh, EPIC clinical trial, um, which was a phase three trial, had an 82% uh, composite cure and it's 80%, close to 80% microbial eradication in patients. So we went from a UTI model in a mouse to clinical trial with equivalent efficacy. This is another UTI model. In this case, it was a KPC2 Klebsiella strain where we dosed Miropenem alone or with Weber Bactam. Uh, this was a very quick 24 hour model where we did Q2 hour dosing with doses of 50 and 100 Miropenem to try to mimic uh, 
clinical exposure of meropenem by itself. We see that meropenem by itself had no activity. We have six logs of bacteria in the kidneys by 24 hours, very similar to the untreated controls. However, when you co-administer vapor we went down to about four logs, two and a half log reduction in those. In their Tango 1 clinical trial for whether you want to call it carbavans, uh it met the FDA requirements for their endpoint uh, for composite cure of 98%. And in this case, that cure was being able to show clinical cure and bacterial reduction, in this case it was the urine, of less than 10 to the fourth CFU. So in the animal model, we're reducing down below four logs in the kidney compared to cure in clinical trials of below 10 to the fourth in the urine. And then we can also bring that over to the hamster model, the hamster C. diff model. This is Summit's uh, SMT compound. It was dosed anywhere from 10 to 50 mg per kg. Uh, vancomycin as the control. See the vancomycin here will protect while on treatment. It's five days, once a day oral treatment, but then has relapse of close to 50%. Whereas the SMT compound protected, we were able to show in the same animal model sequel levels well in excess of the MIC for the SMT compound against the strain in question that were used. Very little absorption, plasma levels were very low. In their clinical trial, their test of cure visit, 88% for their compound in the codified clinical trial versus only 70% for vancomycin. Uh, you had a reduction in the recurrence of only 14 versus 35% for vancomycin. So we're mimicking that recurrence here or the lack of recurrence with the SMT compound. They also showed very little concentrations in the plasma and markedly above the MIC in the feces. So we're now looking at recurrence endpoints. We're looking at survival endpoints. We're looking at level endpoints in an animal model that is mimicking what was seen clinically. Uh, this is fairly old data for community-acquired pneumonia for tigacycline, where the animal model was done showing concentration of the compound in the lung well above the serum levels, corresponding to a reduction in uh, titers of close to five logs. Um, clinical trials were the test to cure was very high for tigacycline in the model, including patients had secondary bacteremia. If you couple the data that was seen in the animal model with the back for pneumonia with bacteremia and lower ED50s, this makes sense because you have high efficacy in both. So it makes sense that clinically, the patient had strep pneumonia, bacteremia, along with lung infection, the tigacycline should have been efficacious. There are some downfalls. Uh, I won't go through the size, a lot of material here. Daptomycin did have a failure when they went for their uh, community acquired pneumonia trial. They only had 79% test to cure uh, versus 88% for ceftriaxone. The problem here was when they went forward with this, they were using data from uh, Staph aureus hematologist pneumonia or inhal inhalation anthrax pneumonia, where the infection itself occupies a different space and has a different reaction in the lung. And when they did their community-acquired pneumonia trial, it was more like what should have been uh, normal bronchial alveolar navage pneumonia. So they had failure in their clinical trial. And this was a really nice paper for Jared Silverman that explained the binding to lung surfactant, which prevented their activity in normal community-acquired pneumonia versus some of the more advanced models like HP or IA. So you have to design the right model to move forward into those clinical trials and know what that model is going to tell you. So to summarize um, <clears throat> the advantages of animal models, they're generally predictive for antibacterials of the corresponding human indications and efficacy. Uh, they're going to give you a lot of valuable information in terms of efficacy, toxicity, distribution, PK. Um, they're going to aid in understanding the mechanism of disease, whether you need prophylactic or therapeutic treatment. They're going to help guide your dose 
in phase one and two trials, particularly if you couple efficacy models with PKPD, relatively low cost. Uh, you can do high throughput and they're going to be able to use the bacteria of the indications you want to use. There are some disadvantages. There are going to be some PK differences, higher metabolism in the mouse, maybe lower bioavailability, possibly different protein binding. Um, they may not be entirely similar, but they're going to give you a proof of concept. Uh, there's some limitations of host-specific pathogens, particularly with the antivirals, um, not so much with the uh, antibacterials. There's a lot of push for alternate methods. Uh, there's a lot of ethical considerations. Uh, there's a public perception of animal model that is negative. Um, and most of all, they do have teeth. They're not happy with what you're doing. You never met somebody that got bit by a rat twice. So uh, in summary, again, you have to use the right animal model. There's a lot of things that go into choosing that right and designing that right animal model. Um, and at this point, we have about a half an hour, I think, to, to take questions. I'm going to thank everybody for their time. So thanks very much, Bill, for that fantastic presentation. Um, you crammed a huge amount in the time you had. Um, can I remind the participants that if they would like to ask a question, could they please fill in the um, the, the, the small box in the uh, in the pop-up screen, and, and then I'll try to ask as many questions as I possibly can over the next 30 minutes. Um, so we've already got quite a lot of questions, and I'll I'll try to sort of summarise a few of them together uh, and group where necessary. But the first question that came through was, what makes the thigh infection model such a an industry standard, such a workhorse, uh, and also really related to that? Could the thigh infection model be used for any pathogen, or are there some difficult organisms in that model? Uh, I think it's become a workhorse. Uh, in my mind, the thigh infection was always developed to answer most of your PKPD questions. It's an easy access. It You can get very good growth in that thigh. Most organisms will grow there. It involves immunocompromised host um uh is it a relevant infection uh some may argue it's a deep-seated tissue infection so it's relative to a skin or muscle infection i would hesitate to use it necessarily as a screening tool i think it has its most use uh for pkpd um just to define your parameter for efficacy over different dosing regimens because it works very well for that I wouldn't use it to necessarily move a compound forward into the clinic only. Okay, and um, the, the, the sort of the related question was that was, um, can it be used for any pathogen or are there some particularly difficult pathogens in the thigh model? Um, I would have to say most of your gram negatives, yes. You have an immunocompromised host. There is neutrophils have been knocked down. Um, you can use it for most clubs, pseudomonas, acinetobacters, E. coli, things like that. Uh, because you and you have to be careful there with adjusting the inoculum to the right amount. We want to standardize the inoculum for a thigh model somewhere in the ton, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 range. There are some gram positive that becomes a little bit more difficult in the thigh. Um, we had a heck of a time trying to get, say, enterococcus to do well in the thigh, even with immunocompromised animals. Okay, thanks. Yes, that's very similar experience to us. So, so thanks for that comment. Um, the, the next question, really, I guess it's it, it's two or three questions in one. Uh, the, the, the question is, do you see any use for the Galeria um, wax moth model? And I, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this in sort of two ways. First of all, where does it fit into the drug screening cascade? Um, uh, and I think, um, and also, um, I, I guess, it, you know, how, how does it fit into lower resource or for, for early screening models? So I don't know if you can comment on that at all. Sure. I, I personally have not used that model. I've read about it and I know about it. I know people will use it um, because they have the ability to do that type of screening in the laboratory without the need of a vivarium, all the IACUC protocols, 
or they can do it with you know less than a mig of compound if they have a lot of compounds to screen through. Uh, I think it's probably fine for that, keeping in mind that you will always have to move that and prove that it also applies in an animal model. So if you are limited resources, limited material, and you need to pick one to move forward with, um, I, I think you can do that type of screening, but you, you do have to validate that uh, and whether or not that correlates to, to the situation in an animal. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, that's to, to my opinion on it, I, I agree. I mean, we use these fairly routinely here, but we use them almost as a negative. So if it doesn't work in a galeria, we don't believe it's probably going worth going forward into an animal. If we see efficacy in a, a galeria strain, we tend to um, uh, to progress it. So so we use it as a, I guess, a go no go. Um, and is that Peter? Is that always correlated well? Have you ever gotten something that reversed? Um, <laughs> it depends on the type of agent, but if it's a classic small molecule, it's reasonably predictive. Okay. So um, the, the the next question, I think you covered very briefly um, in, in your presentation, but I think somebody'd like a bit more information about the tra uh, they, they they say intraurethral infection um, of, of uh, the mouse UTI model. So I don't know if you can describe very briefly the the, the way you infect mice in that model. Sure. So for that, we're, because the inoculum has to be very low, and, and we're using 50 microliters, we will create a very high inoculum concentration of 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10. Uh, the mice are anesthetized. Um, we will take a syringe uh, that's attached to PE10 tubing. Uh, this is inserted into the urethra of the female mouse, advanced slightly. Uh, and then the 50 microliters is slowly injected because you don't want to get reflux of that. It's slow injection. It'll push its way up the urethra into the bladder. And once the bacteria is in that space over that next four days, and I talked about waiting four days before you start treatment, it will ascend um, into the bladder, up the ureters, and then establish in the kidneys. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question, uh, you may take about two hours to answer, I'm afraid, it's a really great question, is how do you translate MIC to human dose? And are there any specific references that, 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 that can be followed up? MIC <laughs> to human dose? M MIC to human dose, it's uh, a, a good question. It, it's a good question, it's a question we get a lot, and, and it, you're right, it's very difficult to answer. And it does go back to um, we, I've seen so many programs come forward with wanting to go into an animal model and what do I go forward with and how do I dose that? Um, and, and to answer that, we have tested or we have seen molecules that, again, have MICs in the nanogram per mil range. You know, you look at something like revampin, a lot of staph aureus are susceptible to revampin at two nanograms per mil. And we've seen ones with MICs, um, you know, eight to 16 micrograms per mil. Um, so how do you translate? How do you decide how to move forward? How do you dose an animal to see whether it's worth it? And if you get efficacy, how do you move that to a human dose? It is really hard to explain that very quickly, but you can actually cure any infection we have a higher MIC as long as you could achieve that level in a non-toxic way in an animal or human host. So you can say, I have an MIC of four micrograms per mil. I'm going to move that into an animal model. In my mind, if somebody came to me with four micrograms per mil, I would want to dose an animal at least 32 mix per kg to start with to see whether or not we get efficacy. Again, that's knowing nothing about the molecule. It's a, it's a kind of a, like a just a not exactly a great rule but that's how we do it if you're getting efficacy then you're looking at the pk what is the exposure in the animal model that gave me efficacy to cover that strain that has an mic of say four micrograms per mil can i achieve that exposure in a human and your phase one trials will tell you that and that's how you're going to target that if i can achieve that exposure at the PKPT parameter that's responsible for efficacy to cover that organism in a human, then I've set my dose for my phase two trials.
So it, it's a series of steps you have to go through before you can get there. But it's possible, in my mind, to treat a wide range of MICs in a human. It really just depends on the compound, the half-life, the exposure, the tolerability, the frequency of dosing that you can achieve. Okay, thank you. Um... We've now got a, another question, I guess a more detailed question on thigh infection models. Um, the question is really, well, there, there's two parts to it really. The first is, um, how about how you prepare the inoculum? Do you have any comments on using log phase versus, versus stationary phase organisms when you infect? And also, um, how about infecting one thigh versus two thighs in the same animal? And if I can add a, just a, a second question to that, if you do infect both thighs, how do you handle that data statistically? Okay, so two thighs, right. So in terms of the inoculum for the thigh, um, I'll backtrack a bit and say that in some animal models, we have noticed the difference in whether or not you're prepping your inoculum off a 24-hour plate or whether you're prepping off, say, a five-hour log phase culture. In the case of the thigh, I don't think we've seen that much of a difference. We usually prep our thigh um, off of a plate. We will standardize to a set OD and then dilute from that. Again, trying to achieve somewhere around a low 10 to the sixth, check the thigh with 100 microliters. So you're getting somewhere in the five times 10 to the five range. I don't know that in the thigh specifically, you'll see too much of a difference in the growth. That being said, if you're going into certain organisms in a lung infection model, things like Klebsiella in particular, we definitely see a difference in the ability to infect whether it's a log phase or off a 24-hour plate. Klebsiella, maybe Pseudomonas for that matter, work much better if we do a dilution from a log phase culture to prep our inoculum to do uh, the intratracheal or intranasal infection. I, what it has to do with may be just the virulence factors of the strain and where they have to infect, be it the lung epithelium or the thigh muscle, which is very enriched. There's a lot of blood running through it. It's easier to grow in. So there is a difference in infectivity in certain models, just not necessarily, in, in my mind, the thigh that I've seen. In terms of two thighs versus one and how you handle the data, um, I've always viewed, I, I've seen people that will infect both thighs with the same organism, do a couple of mice and say they now have an N of six, eight, where they really only had three or four animals. Um, I'm in favor of not doing both thighs. Um, I don't say it's cheating in any way. It, it's, to me, an artificial way of bumping up your numbers. I think you need separate animals because separate animals are just like separate humans. I mean, we do all these Monte Carlo simulations of social differences in how a certain uh, individual will metabolize a compound or react to the infection or react to the treatment of that infection. I would rather see it done in individuals to better get a sense of efficacy. Um, in terms of handling the data, if you did both thighs, I mean, I've seen other people do, you know, one organism in one thigh and a totally different organism in the other. Um, I don't think it adds anything to the data. I, I would rather be the individual organism, um, individual animal for each. Um, how you would handle the data, most times I see people just say, this is the, the end, and do your means and do your analysis from that. Okay. Um, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here uh, because they're, they're, they're quite similar. Um, really, they're talking about so so they're talking about the time point to collect samples and how you do it. So so the first question is for a sepsis model, um, is survival the most relevant endpoint, or is it better to look at CFU in tissues and whatever target tissue, whether that's the kidneys, uh, liver, spleen, etc. 24 hours and replace survival as, survival as an endpoint. And really related to that, so, um, and it's actually a very good question, it, it, it's about 
people sometimes do quantitative cultures at the end of an experiment, which is either when the an some of the animals at that point are moribund mm. or really have survived past the end of the, the, the acute period. So they may be in a recovery period. So I, I don't know if you've got uh, any comments on using a sequential design um, uh, or whether, whether whether it's better to use a, a single time point or survival. I mean, this is a, a, obviously a, a big question and also, um, I guess, related to this, I guess it's sort of hidden in this is, what is the right time point? Do you, should animals be euthanized for culture when they're moribund or when they're dead or, or at some point before it? So I don't know if you can summarize that just in a, a couple of minutes. Sure. <laughs> um, it, it is survival for bacteremia the best endpoint? Um, probably not, and, and for a couple of reasons. One is there's an ethical consideration, uh, and that relates to the when to euthanize the animal to moribund. Uh, a lot of the protocols that are approved by the Institutional Care and Use Committee requires that if an animal does appear moribund, that you need to euthanize it. The only trouble is that's somewhat subjective because is it morbid? Is it going to recover? Is it going to come back? It's hard to know. The other problem with survival as an endpoint is it might mask a uh, indication of efficacy. So it's basically yes or no endpoint. Survives? It doesn't survive. If it if it mortality occurs in 48 versus 24 hours. Um, is that a measure of efficacy? Thing is, when we showed that one graph uh, early on in the presentation to show the difference between survival, we looked at blood and we looked at spleen titers. One of the things you can see if you do that with time point sampling, and you can do that almost like a time kill curve uh, in an animal, is do sampling at two, four, six, eight, twelve 12 hours. Look at blood titers, look at spleen titers. You might see them going down and then starting back up again. So by the time you're back up, you're getting mortality. If you just relied on mortality, you're going to mask some of that earlier efficacy. What that earlier efficacy could have told you was, where do I give a second dose? If you're seeing a reduction in blood titers down to, say, four logs, and then it climbs back up six, eight, so on. If we gave a second dose at that time, would you suppress and then maybe clear the infection? So we are ourselves heading towards more and more interim time points looking at those type of parameters and you could do the same thing for the thigh is that a 24-hour thigh model where you get to see a few endpoints and maybe it's up near uninfected uh, untreated controls you might not have seen an original reduction in the titers so we've done the same thing in the thigh model we've done the infection we've done the treatment and then we've taken time points every two to four hours through 24 hours. And we can show that, yes, we are dropping down the infection, then it rebounds. So a 24 hour value, either in bacteremia or thigh, can mask actual efficacy. So there you do have, there would be an advantage to do these sequential interim time points, looking at titers rather than survival. Okay, thanks. Um, I, again, I'm summarizing several different questions and, this, this again, another quite tricky area to go through. I'm sorry about this. Um, but there, there's several questions about chronic models. One specifically is asking about the agarose B chronic model in the, the pseudomonas or, or centrotrophomonas, I need to whatever it is, in, in the lung you're using with beads. Right. Um, and they're asking sort of, are, are, is this better or not as good as the acute model? And more generally, um, can you talk a little bit about chronic models? Um, are they good? Are they bad? What are the advantages, disadvantages? And why sometimes, can you give any sort of comments on, on ones which are tough or we can't establish? Uh, and, and there was one specific about acute versus chronic UTI. So it's really about this short term 24 hour model versus, I'm not quite sure if four days is chronic, but it's certainly not, not, not acute. But so can you yeah. give a little bit of background on, on your thoughts on that, please, Bill? Sure. Uh, the 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 agar bead model that for chronic pseudomonal lung infection, um, it, it's a surrogate model for things like cystic fibrosis. It, you know, you have specialized mice for that too. Um, but it really is. We want something that's going to sit and reside in the lungs of mice for a long period of time without killing them. Uh, and that is always tough to do, which is why 
you go to the extremes like producing these agar, agar beads, which again, you have to get the right mix, the right size of agar bead, the right concentration of the bacteria. And there also, it's extremely important that we found of what growth state that Pseudomonas strain is in. Um, it almost needs to be grown in the beads for a certain period of time and then used at that point, because um, a lot of times those will go acute. Uh, you know, that, that is a longer term. What, what constitutes a chronic model in a mouse? They're tough to do because you need to use a high enough inoculum to create the infection without killing the animal. And there's a bit of a threshold for most of those models to get that done. Um, you know, I think the chronic lung model is, is a good model to use. Uh, it's just tough to treat, somewhat artificial in terms of the fact that you have, you know, they're embedded in an auger type matrix and they will proliferate a little bit from there. Um, the UTI or the, say, the prosthetic joint uh, or a biofilm model are, in my mind, considered somewhat chronic because you're going out and treating for seven to 14 to 21 days you're getting an infection that doesn't kill the animal. Um, the, the UTI, acute versus chronic, we, we wait four days for the infection to set, and then we follow that with three to four days of treatment. So in all, it's about a seven-day model before the model comes off. Um, can you go out further than that? I think we've tried it with a couple of organisms where we've gone to nine or 10 days, and it is still possible to keep it going that long, but keeping in mind that when we're doing drug discovery, again, we have limitations of compounds, you're looking to see to get an indication. Um, so we've limited a lot of these models to three or four days of treatment for that, for that reason. Whereas things like the prosthetic joint, you can go up further. We've treated seven days, we've treated 14 days. For biofilm, subcutaneous biofilm model, we've treated for 14 days. Um, Helicobacter pylori, the GI model that we have, again, we could treat that 14, 21 days. So where need be, the model is, I know this sounds bad, it's as chronic as it can be or need to be. Yeah, it's a, it's a very tough area to go into. <laughs> so so right, uh, and, th and thanks. I know a chronic model would be great to have in order to look at resistance development in vivo during dosing. The trouble is, most of the times, if you're having a chronic model, your infective titer at the tissue or at the site is fairly low, otherwise it's gonna become acute. So it's tough to have the high enough titers in order to do that. Um, it, it's Chronic models are just a little tough in small animals. Yeah, okay. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'll do my best to, to answer some of them. One, I'll give a very quick answer to as well, and then you can give your opinion. Um, I think it's important for lots of people. Um, somebody's asked for some practical advice. Is that they say it's very difficult to get access to clinical isolates. Any tips or suggestions? Um, one of the places which we use constantly now, it's a fantastic resource, is the uh, BI um, collection, uh, which is uh, funded, I think, through NIAD and, and held at the ATCC. This is free to the user. That's a, that's a great source of standardized organisms. But I don't know if you've got any other comments on, on, on that, Bill. Uh, sure, we've obtained a lot of organisms through the, uh, the CDC's AR isolate database. To registered, I mean, investigators, you can obtain very relevant and characterized strains that are resistant to them. Um, and then from a practical place, a lot of these CROs that do in vitro testing for companies um, do have strains that can be purchased. Yeah, I, I think the CDC collection is US only. Um, oh, okay. so, so, but the BI, the BI collection though is, is available worldwide. Okay. Um, so a, a very quick, nice, quick, easy question. Somebody's asking about preparation of inoculum. They they say, are you talking about, uh, can you use fresh or frozen cultures uh, as well? Um, so I don't know if you can comment on, on stored fresh culture, uh, fresh cultures or frozen cultures. Um, well, we use fresh. I mean, what we've done is all our isolates are frozen away and we will grow them up depending on whether it's being off a plate or it's out of broth, we will grow them up and we usually do 48 hours so that we'll take it out of the freezer, 
grow it up on a plate, make sure that everything looks good, and then transfer that to a, either another plate if the inoculum is coming off a plate, or transfer that into broth if the inoculum is coming out of broth. But they do exist as frozen stocks. Taking anything directly out of the freezer for use um, after defrosting, obviously, the only thing I, I'd say we've done that with or recommend doing that is um, if you have a spore culture that you have isolated like C. difficile spores, uh, titered them, frozen down aliquots, you can bring those out, thaw them, and then use those directly. Okay. Um, another question, this, this is a, a specific question on Nicaea gonorrhea infection models. Um, the question is, is it okay to use the Staph aureus surrogate? Um, uh, sorry, ma many people use the Staph aureus surrogate, but there, there exists a, a, a gonorrhea lower uh, GI uh, infection model. Is one preferred over the other? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of these in clinical prediction? So that's, is it better to use the Staph aureus surrogate model or to use the, the slightly tricky gonorrhea um, uh, infection model? Yeah, I mean, the the we're trying to actually, Furnish mentioned that we're trying to work on that one, the Neisseria model. And you're right, it is tricky. It is hard to get the infection to take and get all your mice in, in the same cycle at the same time um, and get the proper growth. There are probably some critics of that model anyway. Surrogate model, um, what are the advantages? The main thing that it'll tell you is, does your test article reach that site of infection, particular site of infection? Is it active at that site of infection against the strain susceptible to it? You can draw some correlation that if you have similar susceptibility for your staph and your Neisseria, your compound gets there, it will reduce titers of the staph. It should reduce titers of the Neisseria. Um, I, I would hesitate myself using that as a basis of moving into the clinic. Uh, I think you need the actual strain um, just in case there's any type of change in the growth kinetics of Neisseria versus staph and whether or not your test article is hitting a target that might be changed in that environment. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the, the next question is, um, are there any benefits of doing uh, an immunocompetent model over an immunosuppressed or immunocompromised model for lung infections? Um, well, in some cases you have no choice. Um, we have tried on numerous occasions to get things like MRSA or Acinetobacter to work very well in an immunocompetent animal. We could not. Um, there are, you can use certain mucoid strains of Klebsiella and Pseudomonas that will grow equally well in competent versus neutropenic animals. Um, your efficacy or your dose required for efficacy would probably be a little bit different. Lowered required dose in um, Immunocompetent animals, if it grows, slightly higher dose needed in immunocompromised. Um, I don't know if there's any particular advantage of doing one or the other. It may just come out of the necessity for the model itself. Okay, and uh, this is going to, have to be the final question. I'm afraid it's a shame because we've got some fantastic questions I haven't been able to answer. Um, but I think this is a, a nice one to finish off on. Can you combine two infection models in the same animal? That the example is: could you do a thigh and a lung infection model um, using the same organism? So look at the sort of site-specific efficacy. Um, yes, you can. I mean, there, there's no reason that you can't get the animal in the right state, being immunocompromised or, or immunocompetent. Uh, you know, intranasal, one strain, and then shoot the rest into the thigh, do the treatment. Um, are you going to better tell whether it prefers one site over the other? Um, I don't know if you could draw that conclusion. The efficacy you're going to see in the thigh is coming out of blood levels. The efficacy in the lungs should be coming out of ELF levels. Um, is your compound such that it's going to be drawn into one cell over the other, in which case are the more accessible organisms in the thigh going to form a sink for your test article, take it away from what could reach the lung, and therefore give you a false reading that, hey, I don't have good efficacy in the lung. Um, do people have multiple infections at the same time? Absolutely. Um, I just don't know that I would 
recommend it over doing it independently. I know I sound somewhat old school, but um, it, there's a lot of factors that could change the efficacy uh, in either if you do dual infection models. Plus the immune response in the animal, if the animal is normal, it, you know, where is that going to go? Is it preferred one side over the other? Okay, thanks. I think actually Frank Odds once published a model with five different infect five different fungal infections when he worked for Janssen. So we, we, we've moved on a lot since then. So um, with that, I think uh, it's really unfortunate we have to finish. We've got so many fantastic questions, and that's a real credit to the the wonderful presentation you you, you gave, Bill. I think you've you've really excited the audience and and raised so many um, so so many open discussion points and some fantastic questions. So. Um, I'd really very much like to thank all the the, the um, people on the webinar and the, the audience who, who've who've really made this a fantastic session. And, and and you know also thanks to you, Bill. And hopefully it wasn't too much like doing a Viva um, uh, on a, a first thing in the morning when when you're just coming <laughs> to the office. So really really appreciate it. And with that, I'd like to hand back to to Astrid for some closing comments. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for moderating the Q&A. And of course, thank you, William, for contributing to the webinar series with your presentation. Um, as Peter said, we had still several good questions, which unfortunately we couldn't discuss now. I will see if I can uh, get the Bill's help per email, and I might come back to the, the participants who still had open questions later on. And also one note, as uh, Peter and Bill uh, mentioned, the BEI collection of isolates, I would like to, to to those of you who don't know about this, I would also like to recommend one of our previous webinars to you. Um, we had previously a webinar about the NIAID uh, resources for anti-infective research, and this uh, BEI collection is also um, discussed in this uh, presentation. Um, so you can watch the recording of this webinar on the Revive website. Um, now I'm already happy to let you know that we will host another webinar on in vivo models in September where Peter will share his expertise with us. Um, as we see, this is a very, very big topic and I'm sure we have lots to talk about in another webinar. And following his webinar, we will aim to host a combined second Q&A session for both webinars, which we would like to take place at a time which will also allow people in Australia and Asia to join. Um, now, I would still like sorry, to take the opportunity to announce our next webinars in July and August. On the 9th of July, Françoise van Bambeke from the Université Catholique de Louvain will talk about intracellular models. And on 20th of August, Lena Friberg and Elisabeth Nielsen from the Uppsala University in Sweden pres will present in a webinar on computational modeling for population PK and PKPD. You can already register for these webinars on the Revive website. And with this, I would like to thank everybody for joining today and for contributing to the discussion. I really hope you found this webinar interesting and useful and that you will join us again for our future webinars. And also, please make sure to spread the word in your networks and to encourage your colleagues to join as well. Thank you and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>